All right, next up this morning, we have Kevin Hamel, who's joined us from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, where he'll be a rising senior this fall. Kevin's been working with me this summer, and he'll tell you about his project, investigating the intermediate redshift circumbatic medium using pubs. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Thanks for the introduction, Gwen, and thank you all for coming to today's student symposium. I'm excited to present the work that I've been doing this summer, which relates to the circumgalactic medium. So the CGM is the gas which closely surrounds galaxies, and you can visualize a depiction of it as the red halo in this cartoon. And the motivation for these studies is that the CGM holds clues about galaxy evolution. It is the reservoir of baryons which fuel future star formation, and probing its composition can also tell us about past feedback events, such as galactic winds. Now the CGM is dim, but a common way to observe it is an absorption detected in the spectrum of a bright background object. And for that to happen, the light needs to be absorbed by gas in a line of sight. Thus, the strength of a line can trace the amount of gas that is present there. So this concept is also represented as the white arrow in this cartoon. And I want you to hold on to this idea because it will become important as I keep going. And now I want to give you more context on what I mean by intermediate redshift. So I want to show you this medal plot taken from Peter Beruzzi's work. The x-axis represents the redshift, and the y-axis shows the cosmic star formation rate density, or how many stars form in a year over a particular volume of the universe. The black points are observed populations of galaxies, and this red fitting line is the calculated trend associated with its error, explained in that paper. But the main punchline is that throughout the history of the universe, the activity level increased up to a peak known as cosmic noon before it started decreasing to today's low levels. And there's been CGM studies done in the Z equals two to three regime by the KBSS project and in our local universe by teams such as Cause Halos. But few measurements have been made in between and we're trying to bridge that current gap. So these are some of the questions that we thought of investigating this summer. First, we wanna know what the regal distribution of gas surrounding galaxies is. And does it vary with the ionization state of the gas? Does the radial trend depend on galaxy properties, such as luminosity or galaxy environments? And finally, how does the CGM at an intermediate redshift compare with different epochs? But first, I want to spend some time introducing the data that I'm working with. So the Cosmic Ultraviolet Baryon Survey, or CUBS for short, was designed to observe the CGM at this intermediate redshift. And we have 15 UV bright quasars that were observed with the cost spectrograph aboard Hubble. And in addition to that, there is a galaxy survey that focuses on the regions close to the QSOs, and it takes advantage of the strengths of different instruments, such as LDSS3, IMAX, and MUSE. But take, for example, one of the 15 fields that we have with Quasar J2308 circled in red here. And thinking back to the white arrow of the background source in the cartoon earlier, consider this particular galaxy sitting at a redshift of about 0.5 and a projected distance of roughly 30 kiloparsecs from the quasar line of sight. Also going forward, I'll use the words projected distance to quasar line of sight and impact parameter interchangeably. But when I move the observed quasar spectrum to that galaxy's rest frame, I can look for detections of gas which is surrounding this particular galaxy. So here I'm showing the normalized flux for both Lyman beta and Lyman gamma transitions. And if there's a significant absorption in both transitions, it's a good indicator that the detection is real. So here, what this tells me is that there is indeed a strong detection of neutral hydrogen at about 30 kiloparsecs from this galaxy. And using the same quasar spectrum, I shifted to look at a different galaxy, which is this time sitting roughly 75 kiloparsecs from the quasar sight line. What this shows is that for this galaxy, there isn't a strong detection of neutral hydrogen. Now, this doesn't mean that there isn't neutral hydrogen in that galaxy CGM at all. It simply shows that the CGM can be patchy and the background quasar is not shining on the cloud of gas at that location. But what I walked you through were only two galaxies in one field. And here I'm showing the blue circles represent the galaxies with high quality redshifts that we use for analysis. And we have 15 of those fields, so therefore a considerable sample of galaxies. By looking at individual galaxies, you can get an idea of the diversity in gaseous environments, but we were interested in determining a typical amount of absorption, which can be done with a method called stacking. So to illustrate this, take, for example, the same transition, say Lyman beta, in a, in a quasar spectrum, observed for three different galaxies at different redshifts. 
essentially repeating the visual process I just did. And using the following equation, I can put them in their rest frame, and then I can take the median at each velocity across all spectra to end up with one final stack. And going forward, I group galaxies to form stacks based on distances, but also based on their properties. So at first, we organize our stacks based on the projected distances of the galaxies to the quasar's line of sight to probe the radial distribution of the gas. And what I'm showing now are the neutral hydrogen detections out to 300 kiloparsecs separated in four stacks with the number of galaxies used for each stack shown. The thicker black line is the actual data and the lighter gray background represents iterations obtained by a bootstrapping with replacement method which I used to quantify the 68% confidence interval of our measurements. So this is great. I can now measure the equivalent width of our stacks and I can start answering some of the questions that we had. Um, I'm gonna be showing similar figures going forward. So let me explain the axes. The X axis represents the distance that the gas was measured from the galaxies. And the Y axis represents the equivalent width measured. And if data points fell on the, on the dotted black line at Y equals zero, that would tell us that there isn't a significant detection. And the arrow bars represent one sigma. So here, what this tells us is that there is a radial fall off of gas and hydrogen is well detected out to 300 kiloparsecs. We looked at neutral hydrogen, but what about other elements? Different elements and ionized states trace gas of different temperatures and in turn tell us about physical processes that are occurring. So neutral hydrogen traces gas with a wide variety of temperature and densities, roughly about 10 to the four Kelvin. Oxygen three and oxygen four traces gas that's been largely photoionized by the UV background. So it is more ionized than gas traced by neutral hydrogen and maybe somewhat warmer. We can see that they have a similar radial fall off as neutral hydrogen, but overall have weaker detections. And we sort of expect that since hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. Oxygen six, however, is a high ion, which comes from either extremely hard ionizing radiation or more likely hot gas in the CGM that's sitting at a temperature of about 10 to the five and a half Kelvin. Overall though, we see that the hydrogen is well detected out to 300 kiloparsecs, but oxygen species are mostly detected within 200 kiloparsecs. We're also interested in seeing if gas of different ionization states respond differently to galaxy parameters. So we first thought of experimenting with the galaxy luminosities. In our sample, we calculated the median luminosity and separated the higher luminosity galaxies in blue and the lower ones in green. And we find that throughout our detected species, more luminous galaxies have stronger equivalent widths and therefore more gas. This is sort of what we expected since more luminous galaxies are generally more massive. But the main takeaway here is that when galaxies are grouped as a function of impact parameter, more luminous galaxies have stronger detections. But can we account for that difference in absorption strength by say, grouping galaxies differently so that in the future, we are able to use the full luminosity range of the cup sample to investigate whether other galaxy properties impact the CGM. And that's what we did. We grouped galaxies after normalizing their impact parameters by their viral radius to remove this dependence on mass. And except for the first stack, you can see that this different grouping strategy accounted for most of the luminosity differences. The data points are closer to each other. So going forward, I use this new grouping strategy. So the main takeaway here is that most of the dependence on the luminosity is accounted for by normalizing the impact parameter by the viral radius of galaxies. Now we can ask questions like, is there a dependence on the galaxy environments? And Sorry, slide bomb. Um, but the uh, data points in blue, um, shown in the lighter background, uh, are galaxies that um, have companions detected for them. And the green dots um, represent galaxies that we did not find companions for. And you can see that, um, it's kind of hard to see, but overall, galaxies with companions have more extended cool circumgalactic media. And finally, we wanted to compare the neutral hydrogen content across different epochs. So this is something, something that Gwen has been working on using other data sets. And keep in mind that instead of the equivalent widths on the y-axis, I'm now showing the column density. 
So starting out on this project, we didn't know where the intermediate redshift CGM landed on this figure, but we were interested in finding out, um, in finding out. So are the properties of the intermediate redshift CGM more similar to those of higher redshift galaxies, or are they more similar to those at redshift zero? Or are they more at an in-between state? We don't know. So it turns out that what we see is an intermediate amount of hydrogen gas at this redshift. And there's a little bit more work involved to be able to tie up how these gas reservoirs impact galaxy evolution. But this result is cool because it shows that galaxies have less available fuel for star formation as they start turning off. So in summary, we investigated the intermediate redshift CGM with CUBS. We detected a strong radial fall off of gas across neutral hydrogen and several ionized states of oxygen. More luminous galaxies have higher equivalent widths in all species extended to larger distances when grouped by impact parameter. Most of the dependence on the luminosity was accounted for by normalizing the impact parameter by the viral radius of galaxies. Galaxies with companions have more extended cool circumgalactic media. And finally, we determine the radial distribution of neutral hydrogen at a redshift about 0.6 and find that it falls between that of redshift zero and redshift about two. So overall, the CUBS data provides a lot of different avenues to study this CGM, and it shows that the gaseous environments of galaxies have a strong dependence on the properties of the galaxies themselves, and there's a lot more to come. But I want to thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions now. Very nice, Kevin. All right, do we have questions? Looks like Fari has one. Okay, first of all, uh, Kevin, I want to congratulate you. Excellent piece of work and excellent talk. Um, could you go back to your slide on the um, environment radial plot? Just want to see if I missed something. Okay, would it be possible to see the four plots without the, um, the middle takeaway point, if possible? I'm just curious to see what's how it actually looks like. It's fine if, if it's not possible. I, yeah, I think there might have been like, um, I might have made a little mistake or goof last minute, but oh, okay, you yeah. didn't have to. But thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, okay, so it looks like um, you don't actually see a different um, mean or median equivalent with difference between the galaxies. Which, are, which have companions and the control galaxies. So just make sure, could you, uh, the control galaxies, are they isolated or, or what, what are these control? So actually the, the control gas, um, to, let me clarify, the control gas are the median galaxies in our sample um, and the blue points represent galaxies that have companions detected for them. And so we saw that for neutral hydrogen and oxygen three, there was a difference in between the blue points and the green points, but for a warmer gas, such as like oxygen four and oxygen six, we didn't see much of a difference. Um, and going forward, when we obtain more data about the environments of galaxies, we'll be able to clarify and classify galaxies that we don't have companions detected for them versus companions that do have detections. Okay, yeah, I think, yeah, great. I think this is really interesting because you don't really see that big of a difference uh, within the most, the innermost um, bin, radial bin, but you do start to see uh, the two populations start to kind of diverge once you go out to the larger radii. So it's like, you know, it's like my takeaway from this is uh, the gas seems to be rightly, you know, more extended and it shows up at really, really large distances from these galaxies. Right. Um, and, so um, it's really interesting. I should clarify that we, we, we classify companions as galaxies that are brighter than a 10th L star and that are within uh, 300 kiloparsecs from the main galaxy and that are within 300 kilometers per second uh, of relative velocity. Awesome, really cool, thank you. Thank you. But thank you for your question. All right, I think we had better move on to keep to the time, but thank you, Kevin, that was excellent.